This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez, as we continue our conversation with Stephen Kinzer, part two of that conversation. Well, Stephen Kinzer, I'd like to uh, ask you about one of, to me, to my mind, uh, you cover it in your book Overthrow, one of the all-time unfair fights uh, in world history, uh, perhaps uh, one of the most uh, uh, egregious examples of a large nation attacking a small nation. Uh, I'm talking about the invasion of Grenada uh, in 1985, I think it was, under Ronald Reagan, uh, a country that has maybe one-third of the population of the Bronx uh, and uh, assaulted by American troops. Could you talk about the invasion of Grenada? 83. 83, I'm sorry. This really 83. is a remarkable episode as you pointed out. Um, so it happened in 1983, soon after Reagan had come into office. Um, Grenada is a tiny island in the Caribbean. Its entire population could fit into the Rose Bowl in California. That's, that's how small it is. Um, but the United States was looking for a victory. Uh, Reagan came into office with this idea that the U.S. had to shake off what he called the uh, Vietnam syndrome, the syndrome that we were, as he called it, a pitiful, helpless giant. Well, he wanted to show that the United States was still able to crush enemies. But as was always the case during the Cold War, we were never able to strike against our real enemies. Nobody ever proposed bombing Moscow or invading China. So we had to go after countries that weren't really our enemies, but were smaller and easier to push around. And there hardly was a country smaller and easier to push around than poor little Grenada. Uh, Grenada had inserted itself into the Cold War. Uh, the Grenadian leadership had been friendly to the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, to Fidel Castro uh, in Cuba. And somehow the United States developed this idea that uh, this little island could somehow be a threat to the United States. So uh, partly for that reason, but I think largely for reasons of politics, for reasons of um, appearance. The United States, under Reagan, decided we, we're looking for a place to attack. There was turmoil inside Grenada. Suddenly, there was a, a rebellion within the ruling group, and one of the uh, groups uh, turned on the other. The prime minister was assassinated. And in that turmoil, Reagan saw a chance that we would go in and say we were trying to rescue the people of Grenada, uh, save American citizens who were there, and show that America could still stand strong in the world. Uh, so we invaded. Obviously, the invasion uh, was predetermined in its outcome. But what I find particularly uh, egregious about this is what happened afterwards. So this is a tiny little country. The United States could have made it into the jewel of the Caribbean. It's such a small place. We could have uh, made it into a, a paradise for nothing, for the cost of a toilet seat on a B-52 bomber. So we didn't do that. We just turned away and left. And this is so true with all of our other interventions. You might say we intervened in some places to overthrow leaders or regimes that were unfair to their people, but we never tried to impose other ones that were good. We turned our back immediately, and we allowed the tyrants that we impose in places like Iran and Guatemala to do whatever they want once we've placed them in power. So Grenada has stumbled along. It's not in a terrible condition. But uh, we missed a great opportunity. And that's because once we've overthrown a government, we feel we're finished. We've put in someone we like. We can turn away and look for the next country. So I wanted to turn to Honduras. We talked about it in part one of this conversation. Uh, but I wanted to turn to a conversation that we had with Mel Zelaya. Um, Mel Zelaya, who was ousted in 2009. Um, in December, we spoke with the former Honduran president. Um, he was ousted in a U.S. back coup. And I asked President Zelaya whether he's suggesting that the U.S., you know, they had just experienced their own election. Hernandez, the incumbent president, um, had clearly not won right after the election. In fact, when they announced who was ahead, it was um, the competing uh, uh, presidential candidate. Then they shut down uh, all information about the elections. Before we knew it, they announced Hernandez uh, was uh, the victor over Nasrallah. And that is playing out to this day, with thousands of people protesting in the streets. Um, 
Mel Zelaya had formed an alliance with uh, Nasrallah. And I asked him, are you still do you still see the U.S. running the show in Honduras? I have no doubt about it, Amy. And you know why? Because I was president of the country. And they tried to run everything. And their opposition is what took me out of power. The coup d'etat against me was planned in Miami at the Southern Command. So I know here they run the churches. Not all of them, not all of the pastors or all of the priests, but the main heads, they finance the main churches, evangelical churches as well. Not all of them, but most of them. They run the large owners of the media corporations. They feed them a line day after day. And the military obey them because they were trained by them at the School of the Americas in now has another name, but uh, the graduates are throughout Latin America. The private business, well, if you're going to be a business person and make money in Honduras, you need to export to the United States, and so you have to have a good relationship, you have to have a visa. So anything the United States says is the law for the private sector here. If they say go into the abysm, they will. That's how the history of this country has been. They run the transnationals, private sector, the churches, the major media, not just here, around the world, the major media conglomerates answer to the U.S. line. So that is the ousted Honduran President Mel Zelaya speaking just a few months ago. Since then, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, has visited Honduras and uh, the president now, um, uh, Hernandez, has visited Guatemala, right after which Guatemala announced that two days after the U.S. moves its embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, uh, Guatemala will move its embassy to Jerusalem. Stephen Kinzer, your comments. Well, I thought President Zelaya's uh, statements were actually pretty accurate. I, I wish I could protest against him, but I think he's, he's laid out the situation pretty clearly. Uh, Honduras, sometimes thought of as the ultimate banana republic, and we certainly treated it that way. You know, I, we mentioned earlier the overthrow of uh, President Zelaya in Nicaragua in 1909. After that happened, there was one other liberal leader left in Central America, and that was a guy named Davila in Honduras. So we went in and overthrew him the next year, 1910. Uh, since then, the United States has been the overwhelming power uh, in Honduras. What I find especially interesting, and it didn't, uh, President Zelaya didn't get into this in his interview, is uh, the excuse that we used to support the overthrow of, of Zelaya back in 2009. Uh, he was going to call a referendum in which he would ask whether the Constitution could be changed to allow presidential reelection. We didn't like that. So uh, we set this coup in motion. Now, what just happened? The president of Honduras, who just got elected, is elected for a second term. He didn't try to change the law. He did. He violated it. The Constitution says there's no re-election allowed. The, the president of Honduras has just been re-elected, and the United States has blessed this as a triumph of democracy. So you can understand why Hondurans are out in the street upset and how this feeds into a long century of American intervention in that poor country. And, Stephen Kinzer, what about uh, Chile, uh, which we've uh, dealt with uh, numerous times here uh, uh, on the program, uh, the uh, American role in governing in Chile? I want to just point out one episode in the very sad and well-known story of what happened in Chile. We all know that uh, the CIA was deeply involved in the coup that overthrew the elected government of Salvador Allende in 1973. But that was not the first time the U.S. focused on Allende. We had also tried to prevent his election during the in 1970, when he was first elected president. One of the ways we wanted to be sure that he wouldn't be elected president is we wanted to get the commander of the Chilean army to uh, lead an uprising or to tell Congress they could not confirm Allende's election. He refused to do that. He had the attitude, the military does not involve itself in politics. As a result, we saw him as an obstacle. And we did something that I think is really a low point, or maybe a high point, depending on your point of view, in the history of American intervention. We sent weapons, we sent ammunition in a diplomatic pouch 
from the United States to our embassy in Santiago. And that night, at 2 o'clock in the morning, the defense attaché at the U.S. Embassy on a dark street handed these weapons over to anti Allende uh, ex-military people, and the next morning they assassinated the commander of the Chilean army. What was his sin? His sin was to defend the principle that is absolutely fundamental to any democracy, including American democracy, and that is the military does not involve itself in politics. Because he stuck to that principle and wanted civilians to decide who the civilian leader of the country would be, we participated in his assassination. This really was the extreme uh, of American efforts to shape countries where we feared governments would soon emerge that would not support our interests. Last question. Overthrow. America's century of regime change from Hawaii to Iraq. Where we are in Iraq and Afghanistan today as a result of U.S. involvement in these countries? Both of these are, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, are, are great exemplars of a, a cliché that writers sometimes hear. We say, uh, every story is either happy or sad, depending on where you end it. So if we could have invaded Afghanistan, got rid of the Taliban, and then everything would be quiet, that would have been perfect. But life doesn't work that way. History keeps on happening. Things have effects on other things. So uh, here we are now, 16 years into our war in Afghanistan. The military, our military is completely out of ideas. They have tried everything. There is no way for victory in Afghanistan. We don't even know what victory would look like. And our own military and political leaders admit this. Nonetheless, we're still staying there. Um, pretty soon, there'll be kids eligible, Americans eligible to go fight in Afghanistan who were not even born when this war began. So we are there only because we don't want to be the ones to stand up and admit that we, were, we failed, we, we couldn't succeed in imposing our project. The same thing is happening in Iraq. Here I see an even bigger problem. The United States is still focusing on the Middle East as if our vital interests, our survival depends on it. Now, we intervened in the Middle East in earlier eras for two reasons, keep the Soviet Union out and defend our vital oil supply links. There's no more Soviet Union, and we don't get vital oil from the Persian Gulf anymore. It's time for us to withdraw from the Middle East. We no longer have vital interests there. What is the difference between a little more Syrian influence or less Syrian influence in uh, eastern Turkey, whether parts of Iraq are more Kurdish or less Kurdish? This is not in the vital interests of the United States. It's time for us to withdraw from that part of the world. Let it resolve its own problems. We should have learned by now from Iraq and our other Middle East adventures that these adventures never produce any positive results, either for the people in the region or for us. The Middle East was a vital interest for the United States for a while. For a long time, it hasn't been. But our foreign policies don't change as the world changes. We have policies that are set for a world that doesn't exist anymore. And this is one of the great problems of our foreign policy. We get into a rut. We get in somewhere. We never get out. And it goes back to something I wrote about in my uh, True Flag book. Uh, it was Henry Cabot Lodge who said, wherever the U.S. flag once flies, I hate to see it taken down. What it means is any country that we ever invade, that we ever interfere in, is a place where we have to stay forever. And as long as we continue to be in that mindset, we're going to be dragged into these uh, adventures in which we spend our blood and treasure in countries far away for purposes that even our own leaders realize will never be accomplished. And finally, the issue that Mel Zelaya raised about the media and its alliance uh, with the United States. In your book, True Flag, you write that the, um, that the country's best-known political and intellectual leaders took sides. Theodore Roosevelt, Harrier Cabot Lodge, and William Randolph Hearst pushed for imperial expansion. Mark Twain, Booker T. Washington, Andrew Carnegie preached restraint. What did William Hearst have to do with this? William Randolph Hearst was a brilliant uh, newspaper publisher who arrived in New York taking over a newspaper from his father that had a circulation of about 80,000. He built it up in the space of less than a year to 800,000. How did he do that? He came up with an idea, which is still very valid in journalism today. If you want people to buy a newspaper, the best thing is to have a running story, 
That is a story that's happening day after day after day, not just a one-time event. That makes people want to buy newspapers. War is the best running story of all. And Hearst realized that if he could get the United States involved in some war, any war, anywhere, he could sell lots of newspapers by coming up with stories about heroism, treason, battles, all the archetypes of war. So he looked around the world. There was Cuba right there. There was, had been upheaval going on in Cuba for decades. And he took it on as a project to whip up fury in the United States uh, against uh, Spanish colonialism in Cuba in a way that would produce our intervention. And it worked. Hearst realized something that's still true today about Americans. We are a very compassionate people. Americans hate the idea that anybody's suffering anywhere. And when we see a, a newspaper article that shows you about some poor girl who's been brutalized in a country because she wanted to go to school, we think, we have to go invade that country. So playing on the compassion of the American people is something that our leaders, and particularly the press, are very practiced at doing. Uh, just try to focus on the victims of tyranny in some foreign country. Play up their uh, suffering. And then you can produce in the American mind this odd link. If people are suffering in another country, the United States has to get involved, as if somehow we are going to be able to uh, reduce that suffering. So my bottom line would be, I don't mind intervening in these humanitarian crises if you think there's a real chance that in the long run we can reduce human rights violations. But that's almost never the case, as has been proven repeatedly in recent years. Stephen Kinzer, we want to thank you for being with us, former New York Times foreign correspondent, now a columnist for The Boston Globe, author of a number of books, among them Bitter Fruit, the story of the U.S. overthrow of the Guatemalan government in 1954, um, All the Shah's Men, an American coup and the roots of Middle East terror, Overthrow, America's century of regime change from Hawaii to Iraq, and most recently, the true flag, Theodore Roosevelt, Mark Twain, and the birth of American empire. To see part one of our discussion, go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks so much for joining us.